we can continue with the question and answer, but make sure you make sure you un unmute. Remember to unmute in order to ask your question. Hi, Mark. Uh, this is Mike McConvel from Spitz. Uh, my question is uh, primarily based on not necessarily the capabilities of Data to Dome, uh, but the curation of it. Uh, so for the vast majority of planetarians who are using this in their dome, is there a sense of curation is going to happen at a vendor level? Is it happening at the, the, the highest levels, basically at the creation of the data? Uh, and is there any thought to how that would work in sort of, in sort of standardization uh, of getting a curated data uh, set to the, to the, the, the end user? Yeah, so there, there are probably a few different answers there, but let me start with a little philosophy, um, first of all. So um, when, when you want to tackle that problem, um, you can think about a couple of different things, right? So um, one is this idea of um, repos repositories, right? So I'm collecting data and I'm making that available to the community. Um, but there's also this idea of something that's more like a registry model, which means that many, many people can do this and they can, they can plug in um, their streams. So with Data to Dome, we're really thinking about it in, in terms of this registry model. If I think about what's happened historically in the planetarium field with the advent of digital planetariums, um, digital universe made a huge impact, right? It was this wonderful curated, data set. But for a while, there are problems with that model. One is that we had this one static data set that was provided by one group, and as new discoveries were being made, things weren't being added to it. Everybody was waiting on that happening. So um, with the data to dough model, anybody can sign up to provide a feed. And that can be a vendor, that can be a content provider like ESO, um, there are new feeds coming on from the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, um, Quanta Magazine um, from the, the Simons Foundation is about to start their own feed. Um, and then it's, it's the matter, it's, it's just up to the planetarian to decide who are the ones that I want to pay attention to and who do I subscribe to. So I can start my own personal feed? Yeah, please do. All right, well, that sounds great. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Uh, I might as well um, read off that last uh, thing in the chat, which is from Ryan, actually. But he says for later discussion. Well, this yeah. is this is the later. This discussion. is later. Uh, I can go ahead and chime in. Yeah, I was uh, just going to let everyone. This is just my. Um, a little fetchiness about um, Zoe's uh, dark matter uh, <laughs> research, because I mean, if you show a person with an image and something that's dark and ask where the dark stuff is, then they point at the dark stuff. Doesn't seem like a particularly meaningful result to me, and it doesn't suggest that we've accomplished the important thing, which is to scaffold the idea of you know, this might be called dark matter, but it's really invisible matter. People have trouble with dark matter they think of it as opaque and so um, my concern is that that representation actually just ends up reinforcing um, 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 miscomprehension anyway so that's just my curmudgeonly uh, comment <laughs> yeah, thing. I mean of course the real problem has to do with the name which we can't undo at this point right yeah if we're going to go back and, and do this properly, we, we wouldn't be dealing with that. Um, I don't know if it's terribly obvious. I mean, I think there are lots of, well, uh, you know, I, I mentioned when I showed that, that uh, part of the reason why, the reason we started inverting it wasn't actually um, to, because of the word dark matter. It was because I wanted to see the structure better, and it actually works better that way. It's sort of like when people were first classifying galaxies, they would actually look at the inverse of the galaxy image, which was a little bit easier. Um, 
I think uh, the details to your question really depend a lot about like the details of how that survey was carried out. And then actually the, the paper does give the, well, it, it shows the instrument. It doesn't show or explain what was actually described in the presentation. So it's not a fully, doesn't fully eliminate, eliminate the question. But the, the, the survey instrument that's published with the paper it just asks where the dark stuff is. So, or where dark, you know, based on the presentation, where would you, where, where would you point to dark matter in this image? Right, which is a little different. The, uh, the, uh, the thing that motivated that survey was watching the planetarium show, which actually provided more background um, uh, than I think, than the instrument that was used in the paper itself. You know, I'm con I, uh, I have a concern. Um, I guess it kind of goes along with the uh, question of curation, but it's a different angle on curation. That is, meta I guess it'd be called metadata, actually. And that is, um, you know, how do we actually explain these things to the public? And for people who do live programs in particular, that's important to have going along with a data set. Um, you know, some analysis, some intriguing and interesting analysis, if possible. Um, do you know of things going on tor towards that? Um, yeah, I mean, well, that's, that's a really good point. And, um, you know, in, in some cases, it's an easier lift than in other cases. So, for example, um, <laughs> you know, that, that was a big part of um, another format that you know, we, we recommend adoption of is the um, astronomy virtual metadata format. And that part of that format is when you provide a image, it's not just an image, but that image also includes the information necessary to uh, present it to the public. So it's, 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 um, it's a cat title, it's a caption, um, it's, a, it, it's um, information about how that image was taken, what wavelength it was in, and all that background information um, becomes important. And Ryan just provided a link. Um, uh, when we start thinking about more complex data sets, so and a lot of the, the types of things, um, um, so let's say, for example, the Gaia data, we have the catalog data set. Um, the options for how you want to present that, especially when you have interactivity, so I've got something that's moving and um, there are different ways to fly around it. And I might have different choices for how to visualize it. It becomes a little bit more complex than you can provide a description, but in some ways you almost want to provide like a little example of, of how to demonstrate it. Um, I don't have a great answer for that. I think uh, I mentioned the, the uh, dome casting we were doing at the end, but um, that's one way in which I think we try to provide an example of like, here's the data set, we're going to make it available, but we're also going to demonstrate how to visualize it. And then you have it and you can do it yourself. Um, and that, that kind of sharing, which isn't just sharing of content, but sharing of the flight path and the way we describe and the way we talk about it, I think is important as we sort of get past this sort of just how do I import data into my planetarium? First level step. So this is Susie Gurton. Um, it's been a while since I've worked under a dome, but I'm at NRAO now. The National. Oh, cool. And we just started with the VLA, an all sky survey. And we have a website where, um, so the way the survey is going to be working is that every time we're in the B configuration, because there's four different configurations that they cycle through every four months, a different configuration each four months. And so every time they're in the B configuration, they're going to be mapping out the sky at pretty high resolution. Um, and we just completed taking the data for the first half of the first layer. So we're gonna be doing this over seven years. Um, 
this all was started before I came on as the EPO person here. <laughs> so it's, it's really all designed for science. And I'm wondering how we can make this um, available and of interest, if it is at all, to the planetarium community. I'll put in um, a little link that shows, right now we have a very simple display of the data um, on our public website that really just shows the progress that we've made, what parts of the sky we've covered. Um, and I can, I'm not sure if this, I'm doing up here that I'm not sure if you, this link will work for you, but I can put in another. Um, oh, yeah, I'm watching now, right? The, uh, yeah, with the blue. Uh, yeah, there's an, I just put in another link um, that one of our science is to one of our scientists site, and I'm not sure if that's a private site or not. Oh, okay. And that, so we disabled the Zoom on the public one because it's just really weird. <laughs> you know, it's the quick look data. They haven't yep. really processed it well yet. And with the second link, you can actually zoom in. And what you start to see is some pretty bad artifacts and it's, and they chose a weird color. I don't know why they chose we had a great discussion there about color choices. This is kind of a weird color choice with the purple and blue. And when you zoom in, there still are some um, pretty dramatic artifacts that need to be processed out. So I'm thinking that this data set is pretty raw and it might not be of interest to the planetary world, but I'd love to know more about how this, this project is progressing and how we can create something that would be useful to you. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, so are you, well, let me just ask a quick question because I remember someone, are you uh, using Worldwide Telescope? Are we using it? Um, Putting not, Worldwide no, Telescope? No, so it's all we have, I mean, for that display that I'm showing you, it's just for um, using Aladdin Light, right? We just imported PNG images into Aladdin Light to, to create that. Um, we haven't been tagging everything with AVM for this data set. Things in our gallery are tagged with AVM and are going and are in Worldwide Telescope and AstroPix. But okay. this data set is going to be huge. And we haven't, from an EPO perspective, we haven't begun to tackle just how to make this thing available in Worldwide Telescope. Yeah, it is a it is a big challenge, um, but it does it provides sort of an automatic way that it, it could be viewed in some planetary at least. Um, uh, you know, it's a challenge, right? Even as an uh, all sky survey, how do you, how do you make that work in Worldwide Telescope? I know how to do it for the individual. Oh, like radio is hard, right? Um, no, <laughs> I don't have pretty data. <laughs> um, I think, you know, part of, uh, it was interesting. We were, um, I was talking about uh, this with a colleague and there was that, uh, that, that great ALMA result about the sort of early group of galaxies, right? Yeah. Um, but they- And it was a couple of little orange blobs, right? <laughs> a couple of little orange blobs, but that's not the video that's going around, right? It's, right. It's the beautiful visual galaxies that are, artwork but they don't look like artwork and people don't realize that it's artwork right mm -hmm. um so there you know there are challenges uh with some of this stuff uh but i don't know if i have a good answer i just think like having some nice examples um and of course uh you know the way that radio works well is when you pair it with other imaging and, uh, yeah, in our gallery, I mean, the composites, you know, um, especially like Herc A is, is one of my favorites, where you composite yeah. with just this little fuzzy, you know, elliptical galaxy. And it's, it's a beautiful Hubble image of the elliptical galaxy, but zowie, look at those jets. Um, yep. you know, and with each one of the configurations, it's like you get the big, giant, blobby um, jets, but then once we layer in the A configuration, it's like someone took a very fine tip pencil and our 
just drawing in crazy details um, into those jets. So that kind of image we have already in AstroPix, and it's because it's a single thing that we can label. I'm just wondering if, if giant surveys like this, how do they become useful? Yeah, it's a, it's a thing that many projects are struggling with. Well, um, now you all know, and if you have any ideas, <laughs> contact me at NRAO. All right, thank you. You know, but part of, part of the answer really is, and in this model is that, you know, if you make the resources available, we've got a community of people who tell stories around science and data and uh, giving them something to set them loose. Hopefully they will think of something that you uh, don't immediately think of, right? So, so you uh, yeah, you mentioned a standard format. Is that published somewhere? Uh, yes. Um, there are limitations to what that includes, but yes. Um, if you go, if you go to the data to dome.org site, which I put at the top of the group chat, there are links to the papers that describe the format. And if you go, um, if you go to, um, uh, like I have the, um, some of the IPS links, the, the um, Wait. it's a dome page that I put at the top there. Yeah. There are a bunch of links there okay. and even some examples of how to, read the format with Python or something like that. Okay, terrific. Thank you. You know, uh, Dave Cuomo had his hand up for a while and then he put his, I guess, I guess his arm got tired. I but, simultaneously uh, answered his question on chat while trying to respond verbally to Susie, which oh, was okay. challenging. Great. <laughs> I have a question I'd like to chime in on, if that's okay. Sure. Um, my name's Heather Jones. I'm from Mount San Antonio College. Hi. And uh, we've got uh, a Digistar 5 that we're running on our system. And mm -hmm. uh, Evans and Sutherland's put together this great um, cloud, is what they call it, where right. other people can create content and share it. How is mm -hmm. Data to Dome going to be different from a uh, group sharing like that? Um, the, the, there, there are a couple of motivations there. Uh, and so let me step back a little bit. So again, that nomenclature I, I mentioned at the, the beginning and data to dome at that particular format and data to dome as sort of a, a philosophy about just making more data savvy planetariums and really sort of data science for the planetarium community. So it's the bigger thing that I, I'm more interested. Data to Dome as a format um, is, is not as sophisticated as the cloud in terms of it's just a way to register things with the, the Digistar cloud. One thing that is important um, and I, for the community to go forward is to create mechanisms to share content that work across different vendors. So right now, I think we have this really fragmented community where people with different systems um, share with each other. And sometimes it's even more fragmented than it should be because, uh, well, you know this, right? It's like, did you start five people can't share things with did you start four or did you start six? And there are even did you start three people around? Um, and getting beyond, uh, uh, the way we fragment ourselves among different vendors so that um, we can share things across the entire community. And so part of the general philosophy um, that we're kind of pushing with these data standards is to have standards that are closer to what the scientists are using. So I don't have to do all kinds of transformations to put things in um, a particular format so it can display in my planetarium. And then somebody else does their own different transformation. Um, if you actually go, um, if you go to, well, let me actually see. Let me see if I can do this. So I'm gonna share my screen again. And I'm going to go here. 
still here. Sharing my screen again. Um, and, uh, you know, if you go here, these are some tutorials we did from a Data to Dome workshop uh, in Tokyo last year at NAOJ. But some of these examples, let me find one. So these are all working with. There's some different examples here. Um, um, working with Jupyter Notebook, which is this format that's becoming super popular in, well, it's becoming sort of a de facto astronomy, standard astronomy. Uh-oh, that's not very good. Um, but but in the, across many sciences. And um, what uh, they show is basically the process like, how do I, well, that's a terrible example, isn't it? Um, how do I get some data um, into my system from a survey, and then how do I go out and put it into a different planetarium system? And so the example I was going to show you is going to do that for many different systems, so you can see what the difference is, and there are all kinds of little details about what coordinate systems people use, and do I have to convert things into Cartesian coordinates or spherical coordinates? All these little nagging details that we've been struggling with that really we shouldn't be struggling with. Anyway, so that's that's the long answer, and uh, I'll stop screen sharing since I couldn't bring up what I wanted to. But the big answer is I sort of want to move beyond um, the vendor-dependent solutions to, to sort of a community-wide network. That definitely answered my question. Thank you so much. So it sounds like it's going to make it so everything's more inclusive and more people can share across platforms. Okay, well, the format of these seminars uh, is fairly loose. 20-minute um, presentation, 20-minute uh, question and answer. Uh, of which we've we've gone well over, but that's intended to be to allow enough time, plenty of time. But the remainder time, uh, if there aren't any more questions about uh, uh, the data to dome, for Mark, I think uh, I I personally found this in fascinating, and I want to thank you, Mark. I think everybody should unmute and applause for Mark uh, Brown. Thanks so much. And the the rest of the um, meeting we can spend. Everybody can stay. Oh, by the way, I, there was 18 participants near the beginning of this, and uh, there were 18 participants all the way through, pretty much. Um, so that's neat. There were uh, I counted 20 little boxes at the top of the screen, but um, but that some people were calling in and having their computer on a couple of people had that uh like for instance mark did he mark had trouble connecting his audio so um he what we heard was uh by telephone and that worked pretty well yeah um so anyway let's just open up the discussion to anything uh data to dome or whatever whatever we like I'll give it a try. Um, I, at the Exploratorium, we don't have a planetarium. And so we kind of concentrate on what we can do um, in a square. Um, and so, uh, but we're very interested in data visualization. We have a NASA hyper wall, so we can show super high resolution data. Um, but we also have been using the wall for visualization of NOAA data and things like that. And I'm I'm really excited about being able to visualize data, but again, without having a, a dome, I hope that some of the formats will allow us to do it on a square. So we don't have science on a sphere, we have science on a square. <laughs> yeah, one of the things we've, uh, I, I mentioned the, the Kavli lectures, but we've been dome casting to different systems and um, one of the things we started doing was dome casting, not just to planetaria, but also we're dome casting to some flat screens and also dome casting 
um, to VR devices, which not don't just have all the planetarium, but they have the bottom half as well. And it, it's opened up a whole set of challenges to make sure you're creating stuff that too much doesn't overflow from the square, but also is interesting if you look down as well. It's very cool. John Erickson, uh, I wonder if you could unmute. I think John Erickson is sitting there in the in the dark of the planetarium. Uh, yes, I am. And you mentioned to me the other day about putting up molecular models on the dome. And I wonder if that actually fits in with this discussion somehow. I was thinking a little about that. I'm, it's an analog. There's the protein database, which is a molecular biologist's version of data to dome. It's sort of crowdsourced. And the Digital Sky 2 supports protein database files to project. It's not the same as Data to Dome, but I see it as similar in having lots of inputs and shared among a whole community. Mark, Mark, do you see that as fitting into Data to Dome somehow? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, that's a great project. Um, you know, and I've used some stuff from it. Uh, and I think, you know, that that's a good example of, um, you know, um, it was in, in that case, for example, Skyscan already went ahead and did it, but it's, it's like, let's identify community standards that are being used and supported by that scientific community and let's find a way to plug into it. So um, I'm not converting a PDV file to a, a .x file every single time, you know, by opening Blender or something. Um, and, and being able to read them directly is, is, is great. Well, it's, uh, it's the babble problem, I guess. Uh, every discipline has its own formats and languages and standards. And so uh, one, one discipline is speaking uh, Slovenian and another, another is speaking uh, Tanzanian. Yep. So part of the problem is translations. Yeah, it's, yep. that's a huge, huge piece of it. Yeah, I think we're constantly, and that was kind of the question about the vendor stuff as well. It's like, how do we break down that sort of babble problem? It, it is interesting though, like when you think about the protein dynamic, the interesting thing about molecules is that, they, that they're not static. And we kind of benefit in starting our visualization from astronomy, particularly like digital universe or digital galaxy stuff where the data are fundamentally, or at least uh, you, can, you can talk about them uh, as static phenomena without um, too much trouble. Whereas the fundamental nature of uh, chemistry is really about these molecules being in motion, and yet the, the software support for bringing these into the domes doesn't offer that kind of, of functionality. So I, I guess it's just, I guess it's just an observation that even though, you know, there are a lot of attributes of these types of data that um, can be complex to convey in the spaces with, with the limited tool set that we have. Yeah, um, I think the, the dynamic uh, point's a good point. I think a lot of what we present is, is way too static, right? Um, and, you know, that makes sense because it takes a while for stars to move. Of course, now we know where they're all moving. So maybe we, um, Again, but there's, there's a lot more that we can do. Um, there, if I think about um, the sort of broader visualization communities, think about like information visualization, right? Like plots and graphs. There are a couple of, there's this dichotomy with the way that people want to do that. So um, one option is to get a piece of software that can make all the beautiful graphs I want. It could be Excel or it could be something fancier like Tableau and you load in the, the data, it reads all the different data formats and it makes all the plots you want. 
Um, another philosophy is to have more individual control about how you present what you want to talk about, more programmatic control. So that's things like D3, if anyone's played with D3, where you can make these really cool customized visualizations. It's what like a lot of those great uh, interactive New York Times infographics use, like all the political ones or the sports ones. Um, I think it's the same, we're seeing that same sort of, um, well, we will see that same sort of thing going on in the planetarium community. So, so far, people have been using planetarium software and, um, and that allows you to import certain things and show certain things. It allows you to take their base things that you can show and extend them and, and control them in certain ways. Um, but there's some new capabilities, um, particularly with the um, ability to, uh, with programmable graphic shaders, to really let people customize um, their visualizations. And so everybody running that same piece of software doesn't look the same, and you can really control the way things move, how dynamic your visualizations are. Um, that's something we've been pushing a lot on using um, Uniview because Uniview is really good at exposing the graphic shaders. Everybody exposes them a little bit, but it's actually pretty hard in most of the systems. Um, but I, I, I think that's the next big frontier in planetary visualization is really customizable um, stuff. A strange thought just, oh, John. Oh. Hey, Alan. Did you just arrive? Uh, okay, the, we're reaching the end, actually, of this uh, session, but, you know, a strange thought occurred to me was um, that uh, um, the color profiles that you were talking about, Mark, you know, that, and, and then the importance of that, when I was thinking about visualizing things, uh, I was thinking back to movies and how important music is. So I wonder if we need to have a music, uh, music component to this visualization process. Uh, that's, Maybe. It's a whole other some... job. <laughs> Maybe. Of course. Like we only I... have so many inputs, right? Uh, need yeah. To tackle them all. Yeah. Well, that's part of the whole production of a planetarium show that's, uh, that is overlooked often. Mark, is there anything within sort of the, the conceptual framework of Data to Dome uh, that focuses a little bit on perhaps like the, the, the qualitative side of it? That we've got the data, we're getting it to domes, that at some point we're kind of getting past the proprietary nature of the system so that you can go and, and, and move these assets between. But is there anything that, that we could do to help facilitate sort of the, the planetarians who might be very effective in communicating certain aspects of that data and, and building sort of a, a, you know, a, a compendium of these people that in addition to all of the data you get, there's a sense of these are the, the sort of experts in our field who would be capable of assisting moving this data to dome further and further into the hands of the, the, the everyday end user. Yeah, that's a great question, and it reminds me of things I forgot to talk about. Um, <clears throat> well, um, let, me, let me tell you about one thing which is half related to your question. Um, and so last year at the uh, LIPS conference, um, we had a, a Data to Dome workshop, and, and Ryan participated in that. And it was basically to try to like introduce this concept uh, to that community. I think it, it was a semi-success. I think um, we, probably, we, we gave some demos, but it wasn't really as live or as interactive as it should have been. And really, I think the case that um, probably failed to make at the beginning is that so far with this initiative, we've really been working on the first step of like, how do I get this uh, data in there? And haven't really thought as much about in detail, except for like how we've been doing it ourselves, but really systematically about how to present that data. Um, and um, 
so while it was sort of an introduction to that community, the kind of workshopping around like how to solve those problems that I was going to hope, hope it was going to happen there didn't really happen. We had a nice freewheeling conversation. Uh, but we're going to try again um, uh, in September uh, with the one that uh, Dave Cuomo is hosting in Seattle. And we'll have a full day, so we'll have more time. And um, the, the idea behind that is that we're actually going to set people in groups, um, uh, give them collections of sort of well-visualized sort of data-intensive stories, but let them um, workshop how to, how to make that a live and interactive presentation. Um, the other side of your question goes back to something that, um, again, some discussions that uh, Ryan Wyatt and I have had about, like, sort of building, um, maybe, maybe what we need to sort of bring this to next step is there are, and this is true across different vendors, they're, they're, you know, the power users of the planetarium community and getting them, especially across these different systems, to work together uh, on sharing things. Um, one thing that I really like about the dome casting solution is that it's potentially not just a way to share content, but um, share um, share the sort of expertise that's needed to present with it. I mean, I showed you at the beginning um, the little time lapse video of the Space Visualization Lab. In there, we have we have presentations like two presentations, two hours of presentations a day from different scientists around the community. Um, often they come in and they don't know how to uh, do that um, right away, but they get that expertise by watching other people present. And so we're all separated. The more we can share that way, I think will help as well. I think that would be really helpful. I mean, I, I, I know that just with something as simple as uh, NASA images, just still images that are supplied by NASA, it's really helpful to have a intelligently written paragraph about the image that explains what's going on in it. And uh, that, that's so helpful for making presentations. Yeah, I wanted to, um, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, Dave, go. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on something Mark said a little earlier about the ease of customization or not the ease, the, the ability to customize, because I think that's a huge aspect of what the data to dome, uh, or at least a huge, huge aspect of the potential. I've been working on taking science on a sphere animations and pointing them over into Uniview. And I would not have been able to do it had I not had a module that Mark had created a couple years ago of a simple animation that I was able to then dissect and figure out how it was put together and then start taking the frames from a different Science on a Sphere data set and putting in. So I'm hoping that as Data to Dome progresses that the collaboration and the ability to have templates and easy to understand abilities to take data and bring it in continues to progress. And yeah, thanks for the plug for September. We're hosting the uh, live interactive planetarium symposium in September. And the day before that, we've got the Data to Dome workshop. So thanks for the plug, Mark. Sure. Oh, Dave, by the way, yeah. I figured out the error with that uh, volumetric texture. <laughs> it's it's uh, 2.0 doesn't, it is a 2.0 thing. There's a problem reading volumetric textures with alpha. Oh, oh, okay. The one that I couldn't open up for. Um, yeah, okay. But that was my mistake anyway, because I, I didn't need alpha, and I saved megabytes of zeros unnecessarily. Okay, I knew there had to be something that I couldn't open that up. I haven't uh, downloaded the bundle for, yet for the Domecast. Because is that in the Domecast? Yes, but the, the one that works. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I think you're muted, Alan. Oh, I think it's about time to wind it up, uh, unless there's any urgent last questions. Um, again, I think this was a really interesting, interesting uh, presentation and, and discussion. We, so uh, let's uh, talk another one up, another successful seminar, I guess. Uh, now, the recordings will show up uh, on the link on the PPA. Well, the PPA website links to our YouTube channel, so I'll put them up there in the next few, next couple of days or so, and um, and you can look for them there. Uh, and thanks everyone for coming. We had a pretty good turnout today. Thank you so much for coming today. Yeah, thanks for putting these together, Alan. What's next month? Uh, we have we don't have uh. We don't have it confirmed, but uh, it was, um, let me check. Ryan, it was one of your staff that was, uh, Mary Holt may be able to give us a, a seminar next month. Um, yes. I and, think uh, uh, I heard the verb in a recent conference call, voluntold. <laughs> and, uh, so I don't know, but I'll, I'll check with Mary. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, so, but even if we <clears throat> The other ideas came up at the last seminar that even if we don't have a formal presentation, we can have another format for the seminar that is a more of a reform uh, sharing among participants, more like a meeting, more like a mini PPA meeting, if you will. Um, so anyway, we will have a meeting no matter what, and it's always on the fourth Friday of the month, um, or the last Friday of the month, or five. And uh, again, thanks everybody for coming. I'll stop the recording and.